these days. Nice. All right. So we are recording. Oh, and then just remember, like, if it for the upload thing, wait for it to go to 100, even if, after we go off the air. Um, okay. Or just leave the browser open and okay. walk away and go about okay. the day. Sounds good. All right. And we're going live um, as soon as this connects. Hello and good evening, everyone, or good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are in the world. Welcome. Uh, we've been on a bit of a hiatus from these live streams, so it's good to be back here in 2022. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Li Shan Huang. I am Director of Design Content and Learning here at AIGA, the Professional Association for Design. And so I am joined today by our very special guest, designer, author, educator, Ian Lynham, who is tuning in from Tokyo, Japan. So we have a truly international transcontinental program tonight. Uh, Ian is going to be talking about his book, The Impossibility of Silence, which is a book for artists, designers, photographers, and other creative practitioners interested in approaching writing about our vocation and culture. Um, a little bit more about Ian, and then I'll hand it over to him. He's prepared a presentation, and then we'll take your questions in the Q&A uh, at the end of this. Um, as I already mentioned, Ian is a designer. He works at the intersection of graphic design, design education, and design research. He's faculty at Temple University Japan, as well as Vermont College of the Arts, and is also a visiting critic at the California Institute of the Arts, Cal Arts. Um, and he runs a studio in Tokyo called Ian Lynham Design, so you can check him out online. Um, and then a bit about the book before uh, you hear it from Ian himself. He wrote in the uh, the forward to the book, I thought I'd highlight uh, something and just read it off, but he described this book as and I quote from him, this is a book with ferality at its core, as I feel that it is the heart of writing. And to paraphrase somebody else, writing is a word for the meeting place of the private and the public, the internal and the external. So I thought that was just a really powerful way to open uh, the book. And um, as somebody who's often a tortured writer uh, myself, um, I really got a lot out of the book, just learning more about Ian, how he wove in memoir with some philosophical musings about the process of writing. And so uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Ian and for everybody in the audience, um, feel free to introduce yourself in the chat and in the comments and type your questions there. We'll take them at the end. And we're also curious if you um, are a writer yourself or if you're trying to write something, let us know in the comments as well. We'd love to hear from you, but um, I'll pass it on to Ian now. Right on. Thank you, Sean. That was really nice. So I put together a little presentation for today, and I'm just going to share this with you guys. So here we go. This is the thing. Hopefully you all can see this. Um, so this is the book that I'm talking about today. It's called, as we can see, The Impossibility of Silence, Writing for Designers, Artists, and Photographers. It came out around a year ago, and it's been doing great, thankfully. Um, it's a book about writing and how to write. It started out as an extension of another thing that I wrote. So this is a zine that came out in 2016 called Start Somewhere, a handbook of dubious exercises, tips, and rants about becoming a designer who writes. So I came up with this idea randomly for the zine. I thought it'd be fun, so I wrote it, designed it. Um, it's about 76 pages and I ran off 25 copies at the school where I teach Temple University, Japan. I folded them and I stapled them. And then I posted about the zine online and on social media. And I was really surprised. It did so well that I had to very, <laughs> very quickly make, um, an offset printed version of the zine because it, they sold it at a clip. I had no clue that this zine about writing for designers would have legs or would get any kind of traction, but it did. So during the very, very, very start of the, the pandemic, um, I was reading a book about how to write, which is the book Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. Uh, it was given to me by my friend Kelsey Gray, a designer and teacher who lives in Austin, Texas. And I was in the States lecturing and um, I came back to Tokyo 
and I was reading Bird by Bird. And it's a really good kind of like how-to book. Now, I've read a lot of these kinds of books. Um, see, my dad is a writer too, and he's got a whole bookcase full of these kind of books. So whenever I visit him and my mom, I read a handful of these books. I actually speed read them, and I kind of note the best ideas within. But of course, most of the best ideas about writing come from this book, The Elements of Style by Strunk and White. But there are other ones which are good. But as far as writing for designers goes, there was only one good book on the market, which is Writing for the Design Mind by Natalia Ilyin. So Natalia is a colleague of mine. We teach together at Vermont College of Fine Arts in the MFA in Graphic Design Program. And she's a dear, dear, dear friend. Natalia is someone who's really good at structural writing. So we see an example of this on the left. Basically, you create a metaphorical architectural structure out of your ideas, and you construct a piece of writing methodically, ensuring that your entire piece of writing as architecture is sound. My approach is rather different. I figure out a thesis for a piece of writing, and then I kind of write around it until it becomes more whole. And then I approach structure later. For folks that are more, or for folks who are more analytical and rational, Natalia's approach is great. For folks that are more heuristic and inclined to the poetic or emotional, my approach might work. I actually write in the structural way that Natalia proposes when I'm writing design history or academic criticism, but I have my own way when I'm writing pretty much anything else. So essays or zines or this book that I'm talking about. And I talk about this process within. I should mention um, that I wrote this book during the first wave of the global pandemic. So as I mentioned, I returned to Tokyo from lecturing before Japan closed its borders and right at the beginning of my month long break before summer semester at Temple University of Japan. I got the idea that maybe I could write a zine about writing, basically a follow-up to start somewhere. So I thought this thing was going to be a zine and not a book, which really speaks to the power of underscoping a project. Zines are relatively short, but a short book like mine isn't that much longer. So as you can see here, it's a bit more than triple the amount of pages and words. And if you think about it, like, you know, a kind of basic essays between 1,000 to 3,000 words. So that's a good way to gauge the amount of writing that goes into a zine or a book. So I had my idea, a piece of writing about writing for designers, but I wanted to include some other stuff. I thought about other books that I think are great for different reasons, like what I call totems, aka conceptual and stylistic tent poles for a project. Leonard Corin wrote this book, Wabi Sabi, for artists, designers, poets, and philosophers, which is a really short book about embracing imperfection. And Mr. Corin has sold a lot of these books. And I really like his idea of targeting multiple audiences just within the title alone. So that was the inspiration for the subtitle of my book being for creative folks other than just designers. The Substance of Style by Virginia Postrel is uh, one of the most important books of the early 2000s. It is, <coughs> excuse me, both a really breezy book about style, but it also has some pretty important critical edges to it. But it also has this kind of real beach reading kind of feel to it. So I wanted some of that in there. I really love Carl Wilson's book, Let's Talk About Love. It's a bitingly acerbic book about the evaluation of taste as viewed through the musical output of Celine Dion. And I really love how he set up the thesis of that book. It's both super personal and really philosophical. So it was really, it's really like micro macro. So I wanted a bit of that in there. Plus, I also love this book. I love the wear, sorry, I love this book, I Wear the Black Hat by Chuck Klosterman, which is an analysis of good, evil, and the role of the villain in contemporary society. So Klosterman really weaves in like a mix of like pop music, philosophy, history, and some sports together in his writing. And by looking at these books again, I got a sense of what kind of thing this, this what turned into this book might be. I also started thinking about Joseph Campbell's notion of the monomyth, often called the hero's journey. So here um, we see an example of the hero's journey. This is the kind of narrative structure that underlies uh, a lot of, you know, epic writing. So for example, the Lord of the Rings. 
so basically you have a hero they go on an adventure there's some form of death and rebirth and basically they return home changed and it's a really great idea for fiction but it doesn't really work super well for most design oriented writing because the practical and pragmatic nature of a lot of art and design writing doesn't mold itself to an epic saga per se. However, there are characters and objects in Campbell's model, which are really helpful for writing about art and design. So here we have some archetypes. So we've got a mentor, there's a helper, um, there's a foil, someone who acts like an enemy and comes across like an enemy, but isn't an enemy. You know, people, most people want to have mentors. That's a big thing. Then there are also metaphorical objects, such as on the left here, the gift. And I thought to myself, perhaps I might explode this idea of archety archetypes and objects in my analysis of how to write, because I always place people and objects at the center of my writing. So what might some other archetypes and objects be? So I really kind of cast this cosmology of archetypes. Some are pulled from Campbell's ideas, but most are from my own experience as a writer. Think about the difference between, for example, the writer and the narrator and our actual selves. Like those are usually quite different. And then there's the audience intended for a project and the actual audience, plus some of the really scary stuff about writing, such as the blank page. Then um, there are other archetypes that came up. One is uh, the penguin. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to read you a little piece of the book about the penguin. So I was talking to my wife about this book and showed her this cosmology of archetypes that would be featured. She insisted that there be a penguin in there and a scarf. Both are really great ideas, especially the penguin. Penguins are small, often ungainly, incredibly aloof, and often, unless you're a polar bear looking for a midday snack, unnecessary. Penguins are obsessively detail oriented in all the wrong ways. They talk about themselves too much. They're fashionable to a fault, especially when they wear trendy scarves to try and compensate for their stature. They constantly try to compensate for their stature, which is something they cannot fix. It is best to avoid penguins in your writing. Okay, so I obviously wasn't writing about actual penguins there. I was encouraging writers to not be too self-important. And it was just, you know, it was kind of fun to like come up with all, you know, who are these different characters that might inform the journey of writing something? So in this way, I was able to create a whole little universe that might fill up a book in a way that is meaningful. So here we see some of the archetypes and um, I'd like to read you another passage from the book about the archetype of the plumber. So here we go. I suggest that you put the notion of being a famous writer, artist, designer, photographer, architect, or philosopher away. Fame is stupid. It is navel-gazing and dumb. And if you obtained it, you'd be hunted by paparazzi and your life would turn into something gated and terrible. Fame is elusive, narcissistic, idiotic, and most of all, relative. Being quote-unquote famous in most creative fields has all the accolades, pomp, circumstance, and importance slash remunerative value of being a well-regarded plumber, incidentally the most noble of all vocations. Just be a plumber. Do your work with care and craft. Crafts may be dead in theory, but craft is not. When you feel self-important, remember that in reality, no one else really cares. All right. So <clears throat> I'm writing all this stuff and I was listening to a lot of music, which is something I do pretty obsessively. And I kept coming across all these great little quotes that I might use for the book. So here's a quote from a song that I really like that I used right after the intro. So it goes, quote, come on, sweet girl, let's find you an ocean that goes with your eyes, unquote. So that's uh, from the singer Nico Case. So I use this quote right after the intro, because I was trying to ease folks into the idea that they can write and to try to dispel readers' self-doubt. And quotes are really good for things like that. So that kind of turned into a little strategy I was as I was writing. I was like, maybe, you know, basically for the beginning of each chapter, I'll include a little quote from a song that I really love that's relevant to the content of that chapter. 
it was around this time that I started making these fake information graphics of all the terrible things um, that we associate with the pandemic. So like here, this is, I, I put together this like goofy drawing. I just like drew it with Sharpie, you know, it's called the ecosystem of lockdown. Um, just showing the relationship between microbes and physical contact and horniness and the cloud and the resurgence of ex-partners and Amazon and aging parents and lost clients and alcohol and dead pets and scream time. And I was just goofing around, um, just like, I don't know, just drawing things that basically look like fake information graphics. And I thought, you know, like I was doing this and I was like, oh, what if I took some of these ideas that I'm writing about? And kind of do the same thing. What happens if I like place them, you know, in juxtaposition with each other? So that's what I wound up doing. You know, I thought about these different relationships between these, you know, archetypes and metaphorical symbols and how they might take form in terms of spatial relationships. So here, like I was thinking about margins in both a literal and metaphoric way. We all need space in our design work, our artwork in our writing and in our lives. So I made a goofy graphic about how margins bring elements together as much as keep them apart. And it came up with, and it, it kind of got crazy. Like, I don't know, this, like, this was like about telling the story the wrong way. Like what happens if you really um, make a narrative non-linear? So I came up with this idea of using like portals, which might allow a reader to hop from one section of a, of this book idea to another, which is kind of a cool hypertextual idea, but it doesn't work at all in a book. And I was just kind of riffing and doing like a, a fun hybrid of writing and drawing and mapping. And through this process, I was actually able to get my head around the ideas a lot more and create a dorky little ecosystem of how the ideas work together. And it was helpful to, because like through thinking about all these relationships, I was able to think about and write down the important stuff that's not about archetypes or metaphors or objects and how one might structure a piece of meaningful writing using content, style and form, the importance of practice, the importance of editing, and then multiple forms of conclusions. So really, you know, just like the idea of like sifting through these ideas in ways that were both visual and textual was, it was really, really useful. I also started explaining how one might retroactively apply a structure to a body of writing. Um, this is something that I do as a master's degree thesis advisor at various schools. And the base of this is this thing that I call the triad. <coughs> Excuse me. The triad is um, basically a triangular structure that is the basis for most thesis, theses uh, in postgraduate settings. Basically, there are three points you cannot avoid. One is you, one is what you do, AKA your vocation or the um, sector of cultural production that you work in. And then the other part is what you're interested in. And I pulled this idea out of, you know, my thesis is advising, but also out of workshops that I do at other schools and at conventions. I do these workshops called Doof Doof. So the term Doof Doof, if you're unfamiliar, is uh, the Australian word for techno music. Uh, because doof, 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 doof. this workshop has nothing to do with techno music. I just love the sound of that term, doof, doof. And it's a new word. It's a neologism. It's a made up term. Um, these workshops are largely about overcoming participants' fear of writing through embracing visual language and examining discursive structure. Um, in the workshops, we assess structural approaches to writing like that triad also how to flavor writing and how to enhance writing by including one's personal perspective. And, you know, folks that participate in these workshops are able to assess their own vulnerabilities, their goals as designers and writers, and really learn how to be designers who might craft appealing writing. During the workshops, we employ, we explore counterpoint, authenticity, ornament, kitsch, people's interests and influences, plus a ton more, all using intellectual, emotional, rational, dead serious, and comedic approaches to writing as well. So in this book, I'm pulling a lot of my ideas about how to come to structure from these workshops that I'm now done with like ooh, a couple hundred people, which is really great. And that's all in the book as well. So I'm doing all this stuff, thinking about it. The pandemic keeps happening. And my wife is working at this shop 
and the boss starts being a jerk and about you know making people come to work in person and um just very uncool so i was like why don't you quit and she's like that sounds good so she quit her job so she was you know around the house a lot of the time which is great i was super happy for her but I need a, a lot of space to write. I can't be around other people. Um, I'm not one of those people that can write in Starbucks or something. Uh, and I think that's one thing that's really important is to write where you feel comfortable. So what I did is I took the proverbial show on the road. I like to write outside, especially in parks in Tokyo. Uh, Tokyo is one of the safest cities in the world. And you can I can just basically sprout out a sheet with my laptop and a jug of iced coffee and bang out a couple of thousand words a day. And the thing is, you know, that's the, the importance of practice. Like after a couple weeks of doing this incessantly, I realized that I was writing a book, not a zine. And I was having a lot of fun working on it. And it was just kind of writing itself at this point. So I started thinking about like, huh, how am I going to publish it? You know, I have my own small imprint called Word Shape, which is also a type foundry, but I usually only sell like between 500 to 1,000 copies of any single title. Um, I'd done a book with another publisher, Slanted, the year before where I made a bit of money and the book got a fair amount of distribution. So I was like, all right, that's cool. But like, maybe I should approach another publisher and just kind of like I don't know, spread the love around a little bit. So um, the Dutch publishing imprint, Anamatepe, publishes this journal, Modes of Criticism, which is um, a journal that I've been writing for regularly over the years. And Automatope seem to have this same kind of very independent-minded approach to publishing. So I wrote to them and asked them, asked them if they were interested in potentially publishing this thing. And I sent them the draft manuscript. And to, some, to my surprise, they were interested. So I was like, oh, I got I to gotta get jamming on this. So I asked my friend and colleague at Temple University of Japan, Taro Nettleton, uh, one of the preeminent uh, art critics in Asia, if he'd be interested in editing the book. And he was, and he did. And that was really, really, really rad. So, so this speaks to editors. Like usually if you're writing a thing, you need a content editor and a copy editor. Editor, The content editor helps you sort out your ideas in written form, and the copy editor helps kind of dial in the details of grammar, spelling, and syntax. Sometimes, though, you meet a magical unicorn like Tato who can do both simultaneously. So that was really great. So this is the thing, like I was talking to a publisher, I've got an editor, so I just jammed on, jammed on the thing and I got it done. And I sent the final draft manuscript over to Tato and Tato edited it like pretty immediately, which also takes some time. So I had to step back and take a break. And at this point, like after you write the draft of a book, you're so emotional that you need to give yourself a bit of a reprieve. Plus the editor needs time and space to actually edit. So stepping back is a good thing. So while that's happening, I started collecting imagery for the book. I had ideas for the chapter starts. So I put that stuff together and I had those the quotes from songs. Um, and I collected the imagery that I definitely wanted to have in the book, you know, contacting artists and designers and architects and making sure that everything was like, you know, the correct resolution and color mode and whatnot. Uh, I was largely aggregating imagery for the book, which is a contemporary uh, mode of image making that I actually haven't seen anyone write about critically in terms of, you know, design theory and criticism. So I thought we would perhaps take a short interlude to look at how folks use image aggregation. So here we have a specimen of ornaments from the Tsukiji Type Foundry, which is Japan's very, very first commercial type foundry. This is a collection of ornaments and borders from 1898 collected into a booklet. We know about specimens from type specimens. Here we have a type specimen from the American Type Founders in the 1920s of the legendary typeface Cooper Black. And there are contemporary designers working in this mode too, like designer and educator Paul Elliman, and designer and educator Carl Martins, and American designer Sean Teherachi's zine Crap Hound, which aggregates illustrations and clip art from history into volumes of compositions, which can, which can be reused by designers. But there are also models of specimens and image aggregation that are both contemporary and historical, such as Tattoo Flash, the designs that one sees on the walls of tattoo shops, basically designs that one can pick off the wall and have pounded into one's skin. 
And the fascinating thing is that people do actually do this and people's bodies often look like volumetric sheets of tattoo flash. I think that's like really fascinating. So I don't know. That's just like a trend in contemporary culture. That's really like re-emerged over the past 15 years, I would say, um, in terms of art and design and popular culture. And maybe folks don't think about it so much. And I don't write about that in the book, but it was kind of how I was thinking about collecting images for the book. And that's how the images that are in the book wound up in there. So the edits came back and they were solid. I jumped back in and I poured over everything and I edited it some more. And then I started designing it, which always involves a bit more editing. So I still messed up some stuff. But as we all should know and not worry about so much, nothing is ever perfect because humans are not perfect. Humans don't conform to implications of perfection. So I encourage you not to worry about mistakes so much because we all make them. I'm a big believer in seeing people's real selves, not their quote unquote best selves. And I hope other folks want the same with me. So a few months later, the book came out, uh, it got global distribution, but the rollout was pretty slow because of the pandemic. And that's okay. You know, it's been gaining momentum steadily, which makes me really happy. Um, in regard to imperfection, you know, like with this book, I wrote some stuff that's maybe way too personal in there. Maybe I shouldn't have done that, but that's all right. It's real or just as real as the lies that are in there. But that's what writing is. It's attenuated reality. So that, my friends, was a presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much for that presentation, Ian. And I just want to welcome folks um, joining the live stream. Maybe you came in a little bit after the initial intro. Hope you're enjoying it so far. And you can post your uh, questions into the chat in LinkedIn or YouTube, wherever you're watching this, and we'll get to it. They're on a slight uh, delay by a few seconds, so we'll give you some time. But in the meantime, um, I'll kick things off with Ian. Um, that moment of realizing that this wasn't a zine, this is in fact a book. Mm -hmm. How how did you know that? Or like, do you start knowing like what the final form of something will be? Or do you just kind of let it reveal itself to you uh, with your other projects beyond this book? It's kind of like, um, I don't outline per se, I like ex post facto outline. So it's like, basically, I'll, you know, make a, a document in uh, pages and I'll just start dumping down all the ideas and I'll write little bits of stuff. And then at a certain point, I'll just kind of review and retroactively outline stuff and see, you know, how much stuff I had. And I was like, whoa, there's like way too much stuff here. And like, I felt strongly about all of the content. So I think that's the whole thing. Like, you know, the opposite of less is more, like more is more. And when you realize that you just have a lot, that's that's the moment. Yeah. So you mentioned uh, like pages, you said, and you also writing out doors. Can you tell us about the kind of um, physical tools and stuff that you use? Like, are you a laptop writer or are you like a, a sort of notebook kind of writer? Or what are the sort of um, way you organize your, your writing as it's coming together? So a couple different tools. Um, so basically, you know, a phone with dictation. So I basically, you know, the pages app syncs across laptop and phone. So I do a lot of dictation for basic ideas, because of course, Siri garbles everything. But at least you can like, you know, you can make a first pass on some stuff, and then bounce that to the laptop. Um, you know, like, uh, like, usually, yeah, I, I, I'm not a person who writes by hand, per se. I mean, I'll make notes in a notebook. Um, that's one thing I encourage folks to do. Like I have literally in my back pocket, a small notebook. If you keep a notebook on you at all times when you're not naked, it's great. So <laughs> you always have a tool. Um, and then like, yeah, I mean like just use the tool that's appropriate for you. I mean, for me, you know, it's a laptop. Um, right now, you know, we're going into spring in Tokyo. So I'm very excited. So I'm able to go back outside and write. So in terms of tools, a bicycle to get to a, a park, and a hopefully charged laptop and a jug of coffee and a plastic sheet and I'm good to go. So awesome. That sounds great. Uh, so 
just pulling out a few other things from the book. Um, you are in Japan and you've mentioned um, this aspect of Japanese culture, this notion of ma, the experience of time and space, uh, which you say are integral to one another as they collapse within structures. Um, can you tell us about how ma like figures into your writing practice or your conception of how you structure your writing? Mm, I'm not sure I do. Uh, cause it's just like, I mean, experiencing time and space is just kind of, there are kind of other aspects of Japanese culture, which I think, um, are more integral, especially writing about design. Like there's a term, mon mono no aware, which means, um, uh, basically an empathy for things or objects. So that's something that feels pretty integral and like ma is kind of a part of that so ma is the experience of time and space but the thing is like it's it's integral to feeling an empathy for objects because you have to spend time with something to love it usually right so yeah yeah i think yeah that's cool. probably the closest answer i could come to no that's really helpful and you've also mentioned in your book that you're sort of anti-irony can you tell us a little bit about that position that like that position actually largely um comes from natalia ilyin um through personal conversation and she wrote this really excellent essay called the man in the irony mask um just it's it's a conversation a years i've been teaching at vcfa for a decade now and ever since i first met natalia we've talked about how you know it's really important to avoid irony in writing because Irony, um, we have different perspectives on it. My perspective is that irony doesn't translate well in writing because the thing is like, it's something that is often incredibly personal and people can't read it a lot of the time in terms of the intended tone. It's not a universal feeling. And it's also just really cynical. I mean, it's pervasive culturally through, you know, and socially, you know, but I don't know, it's like a lot, you know, if you think about all the folks that um, read English in the world, most of them are non-native readers and speakers. So the thing is like, in terms of cultural context, irony is not going to be read properly. It doesn't translate well. And also it's just cynical. Like why not be hopeful? So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that also reminds me of what you were writing about in your book, how in your teaching practice, you're teaching these blended classrooms where you have like native speakers of Japanese and, and English speakers in the same classroom. And so the way that you choose your language, not necessarily to be neutral, but to kind of be a bridge, both in, in your classroom and in your writing. Could you tell us about how you find that register? I mean, like... I think so like you know teaching in tokyo um there are a lot of folks who are native english speakers a lot of folks who are native japanese speakers and a lot of folks who are native other language speak, speakers of other languages natively and um the thing is like we're in this weird school in japan where the curriculum is in english yet like Japan is not a place where English is very prevalent. So it's really important that students learn um, Japanese terminology for design. So, so the whole thing is just kind of like mixing it up, you know, like, you know, what is the word for like, I don't know, like, so the word for uh, crop marks in Japanese is tombo. So, which is like the same sound as dragonfly. And like, I don't know, just like playing with that with that stuff yeah, like yeah. in terms of like homonyms even though you know the the characters are different for those terms like but like homonyms can be really fun and it's just like being playful with language and that's something we like try to do a lot in classrooms yeah i feel like what you were saying there with being playful with language also like defangs some of the the scariness of writing i think for for myself, just speaking for myself, but I'm sure with other designers and creative people as well, right? There's like, we often put writing on such a pedestal that's like, oh, that's such a scary, I don't want to approach it, but the way that you talk about the playfulness with language, I feel like is a way to kind of defang that. Yeah, it can be super fun. Like, have you ever heard of the um, writer and teacher and artist, Trini Dalton? No, I haven't. 
so she's like she's based in southern california she wrote this really great book called baby geisha and i was like reading it and like there's a section of the book that like didn't it like kind of didn't make any sense like they were these really nonsensical kind of anti stories and like there were like five or six stories and then like i got to the end of that section i was like what the hell was that and then um trini also teaches writing then she described that this was basically a project that she works on with students um it's called word salad you basically make a list of 10 words that people like and then you try to write a story or an anti-story together and that's like really fun that's something that um we do like i teach design history i don't use it in that class but like in like regular graphic design classes but also um I teach like general education classes that are focused on the arts and like that's like a fun thing to get folks writing it's just like we all make a list of you know if there are 12 people in the class 12 words and then writing something together that makes yeah. writing feel less scary it's a great place to start that's great thanks for that specific example um i think the other final thing that i wanted to tease out from your book is this passage where you talk about um i'll quote you writing is kind of like that you are performing yourself especially when you're writing about your profession outside of history or criticism. And I, that really resonated with me of like, again, thinking about ways to defang writing is something kind of scary and intimidating of like, it's, I mean, I'm performing now in a way, right? Doing this right, interview, but right. that the, the writer me, if I'm doing this is like, in some ways it's an extension of my real self and my prof professional self, but by like making it a, like a character in a way, right? Mm -hmm. Like my writer self as a performance, in some ways it makes it less scary for me. Um, yeah. Totally. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, like I think like um, the musician Nick Cave, like he's a person like in his real life, he doesn't believe in God or the devil, but in his writing, you know, this like very old testament god exists and there there are many many devils and demons and you know things both literally and metaphorically and i think that's like one of the really fun things about writing you know again not just casting a cosmology of archetypes but a cosmology of characters and how you might shift yourself in that like yeah just like you know you can, when you're writing, you can say things that you would never say in real life and you can do things that you would never do per se. And like, that's really fun. So yeah, just the fantastical parts of writing. That's awesome. Yeah, I feel like your book, like reading your book, it feels like we're just kind of hanging out. You know, we've only no, talked right on. uh, online, but the way that it's written, you know, for the folks in the audience who haven't checked it out yet, it feels like you're hanging out with Ian, like in his studio, right? He's like quoting uh, Nick Cave or playing you snippets of songs or quoting different authors. Like it has that quality to it. Um, and while it's sort of philosophical, it doesn't, it's not like intimidating or too woo woo in that uh, sort of way. It just feels like, oh, th this is a creative person sharing a little bit about his process and like inspires me to want to write more. Oh, thank you. Well, thank you, Ian. It looks like we don't have any audience questions today, so I'll just turn okay. it back to you and uh, see, do you have any final thoughts for our audience tonight? And then we'll wrap it up from there. Not really. I don't know. I mean, like, I just, you know, if folks are interested in writing, I just encourage them to try. I think that's a big thing. Uh, I think culturally folks are often afraid of it, especially, um, especially designers. Um, because designers have this issue. Um, it's a form of schizophrenia. Basically, designers tend to... So graphic design is content container synthesis, and a lot of designers are afraid of making the actual content because they've usually hired to create the container and to, syn to synthesize things. But to actually kind of get in there and make their own stuff is something that a lot of folks are afraid of because... Your bosses haven't allowed them to do it. And then if your boss doesn't let you do it, then you yourself start to create mental and emotional blocks. And yeah, I just, you know, I encourage folks to make their own stuff. Um, and I think, you know, it's a beautiful thing right now because there are more people writing about design than ever before. And um, yeah, just encourage folks to, to do it as well. 
and hopefully do it in a way that is not boring because most design writing is really boring. So, all right. Well, that's you know. great advice. Go out and make stuff, write stuff. Don't be boring. Ian Lynham, <laughs> Tokyo, Japan, author of The Impossibility of Silence. I've got it on my iPad, but you should get the uh, physical book there. Um, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll post a link to Ian's book in the chat and in the show notes. You can check out this recording at AIGA Design, wherever you get uh, podcasts or videos, all of the uh, platforms. And uh, I'm Lee Sean Huang again. We'll see you uh, next week for our next live stream. Check out AIGA.org to uh, stay in touch. All right. Have a good evening or day, everyone. Bye.